Look how gorgeous she is. I mean, compared to the car wreck she was before. When a terrorist threat forces FBI agent Gracie Hart to become the beauty queen no one ever thought she could be. What are you kidding? It's Hart. Her transformation is framed as an uplifting tale of self-discovery and female bonding. This experience has been one of the most rewarding and liberating experiences of my life. But looking back, some of the film's messages are less than inspirational. Looks are prioritized over personality, workplace harassment goes unchallenged, and there's an implication that, since you can't beat misogynistic gender norms, you might as well join them. These toxic takeaways in fact aged so poorly that the sequel, Miss Congeniality 2 Armed and Fabulous, tried to rectify them a few years later. Still, there's a lot that this movie gets right that explains why it still holds a place in our hearts. It champions female friendships. We've become really good friends. Stresses the importance of having priorities outside of work. Because I am the job. And encourages women to stand up for themselves. Sir, I request permission to stay behind with a small contingent of agents. Denied. Then I request permission to stay behind alone. Here's our take on the mixed messages of Miss Congeniality and the legacy of this reluctant beauty queen over 20 years later. If you're new here, be sure to subscribe and click the bell to be notified about all of our new videos. Fittingly for a video about a woman that kicks so much butt, our sponsor for today's video is Viore. Viore's performance athletic wear is perfect for any exercise or activity, be it boxing, a self-defense demonstration, or the high-stakes athleticism of musical glasses. Click the link in our description below, viore.com slash the take, to get 20% off some of the most comfortable and versatile clothing on the planet. That's v-u-o-r-i dot com slash the take. Boys will be boys. Workplace sexism is rampant in Miss Congeniality, and the film does acknowledge that this is a problem. It shows that Gracie's hard work goes unnoticed, her boss directly denies her expertise. Wouldn't my time be better spent working on the citizen case? I have a very strong background in profiling and decoding. Forget it. And male co-workers receive credit for her strategic planning. I think we need to get somebody in there. Yeah, 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 now I'm thinking. Undercover. Good idea, boss. Miss Congeniality goes to great lengths to show us that male-dominated fields can create a culture of locker room talk. Ooh, I love my job. It's not <laughs> a bad view, huh? Nah, not at all. And encourages us to empathize with Gracie's struggles to fit in. So it often feels like the film is making a point, or about to make one, about the nature of boys' clubs. I really feel that the, the situation bears further scrutiny in our, in our continued presence here at the pageant. What are you, deaf? He just got paint in the ears. But unfortunately, it never follows through on that commentary. Gracie's happy ending of earning respect at work... That was good work. ...comes through bending to her co-worker's value system by looking and acting the way they think a woman should. And there's no implication that her male colleague's misogyny needs any comeuppance or significant changing. In the scene where male FBI agents literally throw food at pictures of women they find ugly, the film cues audience laughter with upbeat music and even shows Gracie joining in. <laughs> And the film muddies whatever message it might have been trying to send about toxic work culture by making those same workplace harassers heroes that we're rooting for. The romantic lead, Benjamin Bratt's Eric Matthews, spends the film hitting on almost every woman he comes across. You ever seen one this big? Sandwich at me. Showing them little respect as human beings and refusing to take no for an answer. When he falls for Gracie, he claims that it's because of her personality, not her appearance. You're smart, you're funny, you're easy to talk to when you're not armed. But this is difficult to believe. Before she gets a makeover, Eric derides Gracie's appearance. By the way, you look like hell. And suggests she's not a real woman. Gracie, I would love to get a woman's point of view. Oh, no, 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 Beth, you're barking up the wrong tree. So even if the movie implies that perhaps he does like her personality all along, it's clear he feels he can't act on this until she meets his standards of female attractiveness. No, hold on a second, Hart, that's not bad. At the end, the kiss of this evidently insecure and superficial man who has sexually harassed her at work multiple times... Tighten this up. You could pull this off. ...is Gracie's ultimate prize. There's a sense that Gracie's romantic and professional lives were missing this male validation. Just a casual dinner. Huh. We happen to have sex afterwards, so be it. And instead of challenging his sexist views or suggesting he needs to learn a lesson... And I'm suddenly very aware and proud of my breasts. It's funny, me too. The narrative rewards Eric with a beautiful girlfriend who fulfills the male fantasy of the cool girl. Someone with the tastes and interests of your male best buddy in an effortlessly hot female package. If boys will be boys, the movie tells us girls need to learn how to cater to those boys. In the opening childhood flashback, a young Gracie learns the hard lesson that a little boy doesn't want her to rescue him. Now everybody thinks I 
they need a girl to fight for me. And at first, this scene seems to make the point that it's sad our world doesn't value strong women. Yet the lesson the movie ultimately seems to draw from this vignette is that women have to figure out it doesn't pay to emasculate a man by acting too much like one. Call me a girl. You call me one. Essentially, the film's approach to sexism is that it's inevitable, so women might as well just play along, look pretty, and act like a conventional woman in order to avoid drama and setbacks. Relatedly, the film sends the toxic takeaway that conforming to gender roles will make you happy. From a feminist perspective, Gracie's initial defiance of patriarchal norms might be considered impressive. She is physically strong, doesn't censor herself. I get these made special by the same guy that put the tattoo on my ass. Doesn't worry about her weight. Oh, I'm starting early today, no? Yeah, I'm gonna get chip faced. And doesn't let men tell her what to do. We have more to do here. No, we are finished. However, her lack of femininity is not presented as positive within the film. Along with Gracie's FBI co-workers, we're subtly encouraged to laugh at or pity her masculine behaviors. I was distracted by the half-masticated cow rolling around in your wide-open trap. An unkempt appearance. Do all the women in the bureau have to wear those really masculine shoes? Oh, no. When her masculine presenting tendencies aren't played as a joke, what are you gonna do to my teeth? Hopefully, remove the beer stains and steak residue. They're essentially framed as a character flaw, vaguely associated with her stubbornness and resistance to being a team player. I realize I didn't exactly follow orders. Exactly so. follow orders. There's no such thing. You follow orders or you don't follow orders. No. All of which Gracie must overcome to achieve happiness. Interestingly, the film asks us to believe that before her makeover, Gracie, despite being played by Sandra Bullock, isn't beautiful due to her disregard for the performance of traditional femininity. The film equates female attractiveness in Gracie's society with trying to look attractive. Through typical patriarchal signifiers of female beauty, like form-fitting dresses, makeup, practicing poise and elegant movement, and a thin figure achieved through intensive dieting. Gracie eschewing these things. I don't even know the dress. I don't even own a brush tells us she's not good looking since Gracie doesn't have even the most basic knowledge about makeup you know which one of these is the lipstick there's even a suggestion that she lacks beauty because she doesn't know how to obtain it if we're being honest after the makeover there actually isn't that major a change in her appearance while she looks great the feeling of transformation is heightened by other characters over the top reactions oh, is that you Gracie's change isn't really from unpretty to pretty but from a woman who doesn't wear makeup to one who removes all the hair from her body she has embraced conventional gender expression and trying to be pretty it's this choice to subscribe to femininity that that makes her beautiful and therefore acceptable in her society's eyes. When I met you, Dennis Rodman looked better in a dress, but, but now you're a lady. Most disappointingly, the feminist independence and defiance of gender norms that Gracie displays at the beginning of the film It's like feminism never even happened, you know? are revealed to not be founded on moral beliefs, but on insecurity. I don't have any breasts in my thighs. I should be wearing a moon, really. Look, I have been avoiding this experience my entire life. Her issues with beauty contests I think any woman to do this is catering to some misogynistic Neanderthal mentality. Apparently stem from a place of self-doubt, because after her transformation, she denies that the pageant is demeaning in any way. There are many who consider the Miss United States pageant to be outdated and anti-feminist. What would you say to them? I would have to say, I used to be one of them. Here, the film portrays Gracie and many feminist women in a condescending light, playing into the straw feminist trope, a cartoonish portrayal of a feminist that's there to be mocked or have her flimsy arguments easily dismissed. Miss Congeniality implies that anyone who finds something to criticize about beauty pageants must be doing so out of ignorance or jealousy. And it paints Gracie's makeover as a gift. Never thought anything like this would ever happen to me. <laughs> Very honored. At the beginning of the film, Gracie is clearly feeling unfulfilled. Rough day, huh? The worst. And while this may be in large part due to problems with her culture, the solution to those problems turns out to be fixing her. Once she goes with the flow of the norm she's been resisting, she finally begins to feel happy, and her success is directly linked with her adoption of gender roles. She's allowed to be a winner as long as her victory doesn't challenge the patriarchal status quo. You're an important member of the undercover team. Yeah, right. In a thong. Essentially, Miss Congeniality suggests the best way to respond to living in a toxic patriarchal society is to become beautiful. Have you no pride in, in yourself, in your, in your presentation? Homophobia as a punchline. 
Similar to the way that sexism is dealt with within the film, homophobia is vaguely acknowledged as bad, but is also presented as funny depending on the situation. Eric is consistently homophobic towards Victor. Listen to me, you old fruitcake. Which not only remains unchallenged, but is also used as a joke whenever he is made uncomfortable by Victor's interest in him. Actually, uh, I'm gonna take a rain check. I got a lot of FBI stuff I gotta take care of. Yeah. Rigid gender roles are again reinforced when Eric is humiliated by his co-workers using FBI software to put a digital dress onto his body. When Karen, Miss New York, comes out on stage, I just want to let all the lesbians out there know, if I can make it to the top ten, so can you. She is instantly silenced. Get her off of there. But aside from a fairly distasteful joke, Can we say lesbians? You got a problem with that? and a brief moment of Gracie showing support, this protest is quickly dropped. The film deals with other societal problems like eating disorders in much the same way, mentioning them, she's gonna throw it up anyway, but not really caring enough to follow up, deal with them, or insist on structural change. Still, the movie counters this unfortunate message with the meaningful one that women should support all women. Gracie is wrong to dismiss the women in the beauty pageant. What could possibly motivate anybody to enter a beauty pageant is beyond me. And a key tenet of Miss Congeniality is that women should support women, including those who don't necessarily share your exact tastes and values. Gracie originally judges and belittles the pageant contestants, mainly because they've embraced their traditionally feminine attractiveness, which she assumes equates with not having smarts or depth. Well, my uh, roommate's asleep, or she's starting to mold. But just as it's wrong for her coworkers to dismiss her for seeming too masculine. What is it, like a woman thing? Don't kid yourself. Nobody thinks of you that way. It's equally unfair and damaging to condemn women who choose to present as hyper-feminine. By the end of the film, Gracie regrets assuming that the other women were vapid just because they didn't make her choices, and she respects them for all the ways they are similar and different from her. These women are smart, terrific people who are just trying to make a difference in the world. Being a good friend is everything. Overcoming her bias rewards Gracie with what the movie underlines is the best prize of all, genuine female friendships. Hey, I got you something. Oh, oh, oh God. but I couldn't. Oh, no, you can. You ate pizza, you stole panties, you're a wild woman. The best evidence that female friendships are at the heart of this film lies in its title. The women present Gracie with the title Miss Congeniality, literally defining her as a supportive friend. The nicest, sweetest, Coolest girl at the pageant. But the movie's idea of what being a great friend to other women means entails more than just acceptance or superficial amiability. What makes Gracie so congenial is actually that she channels the ferocity at the core of her being in order to protect her friends. If anyone, anyone, tries to hurt one of my new friends, I would take them out. And help them push to be their strongest possible selves. I think you have as good a chance as anybody to win. I mean, you obviously believe enough in yourself to have gotten this far, right? Really? No. Huh? Believe women. The film also gets another crucial message right, that we should believe women who open up about assault. When Cheryl confides in Gracie about her assault, Anyway, he attacked me. She reveals that she has never told anybody else, addressing the very real fear that women have about coming forward. She then goes on to minimize her experience, also a realistic portrayal of a common trauma response among survivors. I know that kind of thing happens all the time. No. But this does not stop Gracie from believing her. There's like so many maneuvers that I could show you that could be Really? The exchange inspires Gracie to teach all of the women at the pageant and those viewing at home how to defend themselves. And I believe that no woman should be without at least a basic knowledge of, of self-defense. It's an empowering scene where Gracie reclaims her strength and inspires other women to do the same. On top of this, the audience goes wild for her ability to fight, creating a key moment in the film in which a woman's strength is valued and respected. Oh, she's kicking his ass, look at this. <laughs> yeah. Gracie also learns the important message that there's more to life than work. I don't have friends because I work 24-7. Gracie is a textbook workaholic, and her passion for her job is her whole identity. All I want to do is my job. She's eager to help in any way she can, spends her free time working on skills that will improve her job performance, and even outfits her personal car for work. Though her devotion is admirable, it leaves little time and energy for anything else, and her life is devoid of meaningful relationships. In place of friends and relationships, you have sarcasm and a gun. Gracie tries to hide her insecurities about her lack of social life, but it's clear that its absence affects her. I date, I go on dates. I know, I know everyone thinks I haven't had a date in about 10 years, 
Because you know both times it was totally screwed up. It isn't until she starts to connect with other people that she can reach her full potential in terms of both her personal happiness and her job. For the first time in my life, I feel like I'm in the right place at the right time, and I have to protect those girls. Learn from your mistakes in the sequel. After the mistakes of Miss Congeniality, the film sequel aimed to right some of its wrongs five years later. Miss Congeniality 2, Armed and Fabulous, opens with Gracie being dumped by Agent Matthews. Oh, well, I, I thought we were moving at kind of a normal speed. I, I don't need any more space. And becoming obsessed with her appearance as a way to cope. The film criticizes her superficiality by showing that it's taken away some of her most lovable qualities. What you could do is just pull your hair up every once in a while. It would really open up your face. Because remember, people care about people who care about themselves. The rest of the film focuses on her rediscovering her deeper self and her independence by returning to her strength and rebellious attitude. For the first time in a long time, you feel like the real Gracie Hart. It also follows her newfound friendship with Sam, an agent who is as outcast as Gracie was at the start of the first movie. But significantly, the narrative never asks Sam to change or give up her conventionally masculine qualities. You would enjoy this. In fact, she's the driving force in helping Gracie return to her own. Gracie and Cheryl's continued relationship is also a main plot point, reinforcing the importance of female friendships, but this time giving them primary importance over romantic relationships with men. I knew you'd be listening. Yeah, well, what are friends for, right? In the final moments, Gracie tracks down a young girl she blew off in the beginning of the movie because she was too self-involved, and makes sure to tell her, and the audience, that she was wrong about prioritizing her appearance and other people's opinions. People may care about people who care about themselves, but I just don't really care about those people. The sequel also provides an alternative to the crass misogynistic male characters that we met in the original. One of the leading men is a sensitive and sincere agent who respects the woman he is dating. That's a sweater that I bought for Janet for her birthday. And that's a hat that goes with it. I'm sorry. I'm just really in love. So overall, not only does Miss Congeniality 2 offer more positive representation, but it also sends the inspiring message that movies can progress and learn from their mistakes. It's impossible to do justice to the conversation of Miss Congeniality's takeaways without remembering the time in which the film was made. The early 2000s were an era when the widespread mentality of post-feminism suggested that all important feminist goals had already been achieved, while also villainizing vocal feminists and denying any need for an ongoing fight against sexism. So for a studio movie produced in 2000, it's notable at least that the film depicts these realities and empathizes with those being bullied or marginalized. Through its sequel and the improving representation of women today, with more than half of modern movies passing the Bechdel test, we can see how aspects of miscongeniality laid the groundwork for progress. To us, you will always be Gracie Lou Freebush. And this year's Miss Congeniality. This is The Take on your favorite movie shows and culture. Thank you so much for watching and for supporting us. Please subscribe and never miss a take. Thanks again to Viore for sponsoring this video. Viore designs their clothes to transition seamlessly from workout to streetwear, which is convenient since they're so comfortable. You'll want to wear them all the time. What's more, Viore is offsetting 100% of their carbon footprint as well as 100% of their plastic use. Pieces like the women's performance jogger or daily legging are made with better sustainable materials so you can feel good about looking good. For 20% off some of the most comfortable and versatile clothing on the planet, click the link in our description, viori.com slash the take. In addition to the discount, you'll enjoy free shipping on any U.S. orders over $75 and free returns. Viori is an investment in your happiness and comfort. So go to vioriclothing.com slash the take and try these incredible clothes today. By supporting Viori, you're supporting the take.